Hello and welcome to Oxford Road Presents The Divided States of Media. I'm your host, Dan Granger. It's debate season. The election's barely a month away and bombs are dropping in the press daily. Um, we are not any more united than we were when we started this podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Jason Kalkanis. Jason is an angel investor and podcast host of the show This Week in Startups, which our agency sponsors quite a bit. Um, if you want to know his credentials, if, if you're the one of the three people listening that maybe hasn't heard of Jason, uh, he is the author of the book, Angel, how to Invest in Technology Startups, Timeless Advice from an Angel Investor Who Turned $100,000 into $100 million. Not too bad. I did okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you did all right. So um, listen, it has been 10 years since I have done a podcast uh, prior to this one, so I don't do them <laughs> often. But when I do, I try to associate them with Jason Kalkanis. I'm I honored. Actually, I'm yeah, honored. <laughs> we waited a long time yeah. uh, till we thought we could get you back. Welcome so. Back. Um, yeah, so I, I was actually uh, my friend who was the head of marketing at LegalZoom at the time, Scott McDonald, came to me about ten years ago and he said, "Look, I just I just landed a gig doing a, a show called This Week in Marketing. It's, it's yeah with Jason Calcanis. It's over in Santa Monica when you were down here slumming it with us. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we had a ball with that thing. And uh, so here we are trying to do a a new version of it. Yeah. Um, and obviously the the reason for the season is polarization, which I think is impacting everybody. But uh, great topic. Yeah, no, no one more so than than people that are doing media. And I got to tell you, Jason, one thing, I you you were kind enough to have me on your show a couple months ago, and you know we sponsor everything. Like we 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 get to be in all kinds of media. And I've been doing PR for a couple of years now. I've been in the Wall Street Journal. I've been been on CNBC. I have never had a response huh. like your program. Ah, that's great to hear. Yeah. yeah, we have a we have a passionate audience. Uh, you know, this week in startups, my podcast is very uh, entrepreneurial audience, and we started the podcast eleven years ago. We've done over a thousand episodes, and mm. you know, it's really my life's work at this point. I consider it like it might actually be my legacy beyond other media brands I've created, beyond the angel investing and the books and everything, because I've had the privilege of like interviewing people at the earliest times in their careers, you know, Uber when Travis had one city up and running, um, Kevin Systrom when Instagram, you know, was two people in the company. Mm. And over and over again, we have these incredible founders on early on. In fact, we had the founder of Nikola, Trevor on just a month ago. I saw that. And his company an has blown up. Yeah. And we just did an emergency podcast breaking down that implosion. Uh, but I basically, when I heard about podcasting maybe 14 years ago, we did one for a blog I was running at the time, Autoblog, and that was the first one to ever have a sponsor, Volvo. And we had to like navigate having a sponsor on a podcast. What would happen if there was a Volvo story and a Volvo commercial? Oh my Lord, could we be objective? And um, I just think podcasting is this wonderful medium that people are flocking to because you have long considered conversations. And to your point about polarization, in a tweet, in a Facebook post, it's very easy to you know, dunk on people or amplify stuff that's wrong. But when you have 30 seconds or 90 seconds or nine minutes to talk about a subject, I think people underestimate the audience's desire to have a deeper conversation about a topic. And we've been very lucky with our podcast to have very deep, deep discussions. You know, I had the founder of Pixar on, um, Ed Catmull, and I loved his book, Creativity. If you haven't read it, I suggest everybody read it. And he was on for like, I don't know, two and a half hours. We did a two-parter and we really told the entire story. So I'm trying to tell the entire story, have the best interview with every founder uh, of every company. And uh, so far, so good. And I just basically said to my assistant and my team, I'm not having lunch with anybody anymore. So no more lunches because I'm getting fat anyway. I'm getting old. It's like the calories just stick. I, I got to skip lunch anyway. Okay. <laughs> Eat light. I'm just going to do a podcast. So anytime any of my friends say, hey, I'm in town. Can I have lunch? I say, great. Come on the podcast and I'll order sandwiches. <laughs> and after the podcast, we'll have sandwiches. And they're like, I, I don't want to be on your podcast. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, so come on the pod and then I'll order like we'll go out for sushi <laughs> after. And they're just like, well, what is a podcast? And but I what just if they force them to do it. To tell you, yeah. <laughs> um, I force them to do it. I was like, yeah, I'm not available for lunch, but you can come on the pod and then we'll have a snack after. And if they're going through a big life struggle, then there's a million people that'll get to hear about it. So precisely, precisely. Yeah, but it, you know, it's basically the podcast is what I would be talking to people about. Yeah. Uh, over lunch, right? Yeah. Just hey, what are you working on? 
hey, anything interesting you've seen out there? And, you know, maybe they ask me a couple of questions and we're done. All of a sudden, an hour and a half goes by. Just no, like I'm, lunch. I'm stealing a lot of uh, those concepts from you as we uh, get deeper into our own and to- totally agree. And man, to have over a thousand of them under your belt, that's incredible. Um, so, Jason, it's a lot um, of work. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Luckily, but, I don't have like to you do said, the work. It's a labor of love, right? I mean, it, it, to yeah. some extent, even if it had no business application, you think you'd do it anyway? Yeah, I mean, I did it when there was no business application. In fact, I started it, <laughs> and a guy named Stefan uh, from Microsoft called and was like, hey, we have this new thing coming. Can you sign an NDA? We're launching a search engine. I was like, sure. He's like, it's going to be called Bing, and uh, can we sponsor the podcast? How much is it? And I was like, uh, $30,000. And he's like, okay, what is that for? I was like, 10 episodes. He's like, so it's 3000 an ad? And I was like, yeah, you get two ads, uh, so it's 1500 ad. I just like made it up and- <laughs> It was Same like great thing as us, actually. Yeah, it's a, similar it's a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, and and you know he just took a flyer on it, and now there's I think six full time people working on the podcast. I mean, we do a lot, like three episode, two three episodes a week. You have to book these guests. We got really high end guests. Then we do clips. Then we share it on social media, and we put it on every platform, and we edit it, you know, lightly for you know quality. Uh, we don't really take out content, but. You know, if somebody misspeaks, maybe if they really regret something they said, um, you know, we're not trying to play gotcha journalism or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but it is a lot of work, especially video. I mean, my advice to people is if you're doing this, uh, I would skip the video. Really? Unless you have the resources, because video is going to be 80 percent of your life, 90 percent of your life dealing with the video sizes, uploading it, et cetera. I mean, it's getting a little bit easier on the margins, but doing audio is so lightweight and easy. You don't even need a, you don't, you don't really need any help. You could do it yourself or you have an engineer, you know, spend two hours on it. Once you introduce video and clips, now you're talking about adding 10, 20 hours to every episode. And it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, we have so many files now. I mean, I have three network attached storage devices, NASs in the office. I spend maybe 10, $20,000 on hard drives every year just to Mm. store all this stuff. Mm. So it gets expensive quick. All right, so let's talk polarization for a minute. So yeah. we're, we're talking to people from every different walk of life, people that have been in politics, mm. journalism, mm. everything. And, you know, you're interesting um, because you've got such a, a perspective with a background in journalism, but also yeah. as an investor and also somebody that's in the heart of tech, right? Yeah. So I want to hear how is this impacting you professionally and then also in your personal life? Like, how are you experiencing the state that the world is in right now? Yeah, I mean, it's... As the Overton window closes, life gets less interesting and I think people get less informed. And I loved going to my Thanksgiving dinners, you know, in the 90s with my Mm -hmm. family and hearing from, you know, a business person, a cop, a mom, a teacher, whatever Mm -hmm. the range of people about their position on gun control or uh, you know, whatever it happened to be, you know, school vouchers, whatever. And, and it was really great to like, I was always enamored by like McLaughlin group. And in fact, okay. I started a podcast called the all in podcast, which I modeled after the McLaughlin group. We've done eight episodes with my friend, Chamath Polyhapatia, David Saxon, David Freeberg, like mm-hmm. three really baller guys in the, yeah. in the, in the Valley here. And uh, I was always enamored by like people having like these great debates with each other. Right. And yeah. Now it's just kind of sad to me that people talk through each other or, you know, if you're rich, you're evil. If you're successful, you're evil. If you're Republican, you're evil. If you're Democrat, you're hysterical. Um, It's just gotten kind of ridiculous. And the the sad part about it is, is that I think what made America great was this diversity of opinion. And we have Mm -hmm. this desire now where we want to have diversity. We talk about diversity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. But then when you think about the diversity and inclusion of ideas that you don't agree with, it, it kind of breaks down. And so that's right. kind of hypocritical on the left. Then on the right, you have this weird, like, you know, incessant trolling and trying to trigger the libs, which is just kind of silly and immature. Mm-hmm. So you have, you know, one group who's trying to trigger the other group. The other group's falling for it and being triggered and hysterical all the time. And nothing seems to move the ball forward. And it, it's really interesting, this concept of framing. Mm-hmm. How you frame an issue uh, leads to, I think, um, how people discuss it. As an example, you have Bernie Sanders coming out and he's like, we're going to have free college for everybody and the 1% are, you know, killing the other 1% and the 10% of this 1%. And it just- Not bad Bernie, seems, by the way. 
I'm working on it. I'm workshopping. Yeah, no, it's coming he along. seems like he's hysterical. And the, we got the band, the billionaires. Nobody needs a billion dollars. Right. I have four homes. The right. Four homes collectively are only $14 right. million. Dollars, and Bezos made $14 billion last month. And it's just like, wait a second. You ha- Did you just say you have four homes worth $14 million? Like, right. wait a second. Uh, you're you're like part of the 1.1%. And you're complaining right. about the 1%. You're like, cut it right there, brother. brother. Um, but, you know, when he framed this whole free college thing, people freaked out. And I just thought to myself, okay, let me think first principles here about free education. Mm-hmm. All right. It's beautiful that we can provide free education. That's a beautiful thing in America. Okay. It's not perfect. Okay. Mm-hmm. We, we spend the most, we don't get the, we don't get the best value from it. So we should really think about the techniques we're deploying and why they're good. So we, we could refine our schools, obviously, because we're falling behind and we're spending the most putting that aside we pay right now for K through 12, or maybe we pay for pre-K through 12. Mm-hmm. So that to me is 12 grades plus kindergarten's 13 pre-K. If you have that in your city or state or whatever, that's 14 years. Mm-hmm. So if I said, you know what? We should take our 14 year public education system. And I think we should make it 15 or 16. That doesn't seem controversial. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, yeah, 10% more. You want to make it 10% longer or maybe mm-hmm. 20% longer, three years longer. Okay, mm-hmm. sure. It sounds like we could afford 10% more. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the equivalent of saying a free associate's degree. So if we said we're going to add two years of trade school or an associate degree to the public school system. So instead of being 14 years, it's now going to be, you know, uh, you know, 16. It would seem very logical and, and we could have a reasonable discussion. Of course, we can't have that discussion yeah. <laughs> because it would lead to hysterics like you, you want free college and then wiping out college loans and giving everybody a pass on their free loan, you know, and saying, we're going to wipe out college debt. Well, that seems ridiculous. That's not fair. If I paid my college debt and you didn't, mm-hmm. I'm the sucker. I paid back my hundred K. You didn't pay back. You're a stiff. I went to work. I worked three jobs to pay it off. That doesn't seem fair. If I said, you know what, we're going to give everybody who has a, you know, um, who's behind on their loans, we're going to give them twice as long to pay. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to give them the ability to pause it for a year if they lose their job. Well, that seems very reasonable. Uh, okay, sure. We're going to spread it out over whatever, t- 20 years. Well, the person who paid back, well, they don't feel that bad about it. Oh, I could have had that option, but it's, you know, whatever. I still got that monkey off my back by paying it. So this reasonable discussions are lost, right? right. And I was a big fan of Bloomberg because I knew Mike in New York. And they just destroyed him like out of the gate. And I, I tell you something, I did a tweet storm where I, or a tweet poll where I said, who would have handled the pandemic better, Bloomberg, Trump or Biden? And it was like 50 percent Bloomberg, 30 percent Biden, you know, whatever, 20 percent Trump. Um, and it's pretty obvious, like we just ran that guy out of town very quickly. Do you think that was him because- a chance? Well, but how much of that was because he just tried to, to test a very different way of getting in the game and it was just timing versus yeah, that was, that was a mistake. Yeah, that was a mistake. But then, you know, I think they were, you know, I, I just think they didn't appreciate what a pr- proper manager could do. You know, somebody right. who is really qualified. And now yeah. we're sitting here with like, oh, well, maybe Biden's not super qualified or maybe he's qualified, but he's kind of out of it. He doesn't seem so sharp. Uh, maybe he's not up for the task. And, you know, I, I just think it would have been a better choice. So, but when I put my support in Mike Bloomberg, I'm not a political guy. It was like the first time I ever really endorsed a candidate. Man, people freaked really? out. People freaked out when I put what did they Mike say Bloomberg about as Maverick. Well, they were just like, he's a racist. He did stop and frisk. And I was like, okay, hold on a second. I lived in New York during stop and frisk. Can we have like a reasonable discussion about that? It was stop, mm-hmm. ask, and frisk. Mm-hmm. They would ask people questions at Friskum. It was shot down as, uh, you know, um, unconstitutional. That's fine. But at the time in New York, when I lived there, it was like 80 percent approval for this because there was a really serious gun problem and murder problem in New York during the time. And even minority communities were in favor of it in a majority. So you have to like understand the context of when this happened. Sure, it could have been a mistake, but it was a mistake that everybody bought into. So it was a collective mistake, not just Mike Bloomberg's. Um, yeah, it was basically all of New York was in favor of this. So it was kind of people were demanding this of him, like, hey, listen, we need to stop people and check if they have guns on them, if they're going to jump over a turnstile or if yeah. they're acting suspicious. Now, I understand we don't want to live in a police state, but you do have to put these things in context. And even having this discussion about it yeah, could get you canceled. Like me yeah. even bringing up like, let's have a reasonable discussion about stop and frisk. Like, what is stop and frisk? Oh, it's stop, ask and frisk. Okay. 
So, and well, and should we what, have that or not? And is it, you know, racist or not? Or yeah. well, I guess it would depend on how it was deployed. If it was deployed randomly in every, you know, in a place where there was a ton of murders, if every 10th person coming through the turnstile got asked a couple of questions, if they, you know, jumped the turnstile or if um, they didn't take the train, but were hanging on the train station for an hour or two, like, okay, that's a little suspicious. Like maybe we we'll ask them a question. Well, I think the, the problem we keep seeing and you're you're highlighting it is that we're not doing nuance very well in this country. No. And it, it's really interesting to think about what we've seen in the last few decades where we now have access to more information than any time in human history. Right. Yep. And yet we want to reduce everything down to the most simplistic, you know, binary ways of, of boxing things into either this or that than ever. Yeah. How do you reconcile those two things? Are they correlated? Well, social media certainly helps, um, you know, exacerbate the problem because it's very easy to trend if you take an extreme position. Right. So if I say, you know, blue lives matter, I'm going to, everybody who's got a cop in the family is going to retweet me or like me on Facebook. If I say black lives matter, I'm going to get that black lives matter contingent. And, you know, if I say, wow, I wonder if, each of these instances of police violence or, you know, um, a murder, a, a death happening in police custody. I wonder if each of these is very nuanced and we need to look at each one individually and trust the forensics reports and maybe do an independent, uh, you know, autopsy and find out exactly what happened. Man, you would, number one, you wouldn't trend. So no reasonable right. opinion saying maybe we should withhold judgment for a couple of days until we get all the facts and get all the body cameras in. That would be like, that would not get amplified. Yeah. Well, so, so I want to hear more about that. Did you, did you watch our social dilemma? I haven't watched it yet, but I, I know all the people in it and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well aware of the, the issues well, I was going to say the the real question I would have had is, did you learn anything you didn't already know? Cause I feel yeah, like I mean, you, know, I you could... probably, you can probably tell us about this, you know, and I think you know what the premise is, right. And, and yeah. what I'm interested in hearing from somebody that really understands how the sausage is made with social media, when you say you won't trend if it's not extreme, are you talking, is that a, a blanket statement about all social media? Are you talking- Pretty much. Twitter? I mean, the, the, the design of social media is to look for engagement. So when you buy ads on Twitter or Facebook, mm -hmm. they tell you how many engagements you got. That's like, if they clicked on the image, if they liked it, if they replied, if they started, whatever the, the engagement is. Mm -hmm. And so when social networks came out, um, you know, in the, in the 2000, the aughts, you had LinkedIn and you had Facebook and before that, MySpace. And people were, came up with the concept of trending and viral loops. Mm -hmm. And could you get more than one point X number of people to subscribe? So if I join, can I get you to subscribe? And then would you get two people to subscribe? And would the product grow without marketing dollars? And that right. was called virality. Then there was this concept of gamification, which they had seen in games kept people addicted, which you see in martial arts when people level up, you see in Scientology when people level up, mm. you see in college degrees when people level up and get graduate degrees, you know, any kind of belt or ranking system. How about in casinos? Stars, casinos as well. You get all kinds of, you know, bells and whistles going off. So these kind of ranking systems people can get addicted to. So they just basically incorporated them. So follower count is one. Mm -hmm. it, they, ne they didn't need to show how many followers we all had. What if they didn't show how many followers we have? Well, then we would none of us would sit there and try to make our follower count go up. Yeah. How do we compare ourselves to each other? How do we find self-worth? Exactly. And by the way, if the quickest way, if you want to rank now, all you have to do is go on and be anti-capitalism and anti-wealth uh, creation, mm -hmm. and you will gain hundreds of thousands of followers overnight. If you literally just hammer away, Jeff Bezos is evil, Billionaires are evil, banned billionaires. This is, you know, you'll, you'll just add that whole contingent. So there are these perverse incentives to actually conform to certain ideologies uh, and certain ways of thinking and speaking that will get you lots of points on both sides. You know, if you want to be on the right, if you're just pro-Trump, you're going to get all those Trump followers. And so then you see these weird people and you're like, wow, what are they doing on social media all day? Like this person's talking about Trump being a Russian spy all day. And remember what during the Russiagate stuff, the people yeah. who were covering the Russiagate stuff just got hundreds of thousands of followers. Then on the other side, if you're just pro-Trump and you want to close the borders, you get all of those people, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, most Americans, most human beings probably agree on 80, 90% of issues, but 
it's it's kind of a not going to trend. It's not going to get to trending topics because again, if I were to say, and, I mean, let's really touch the third rail. Yeah. If you look at these police shootings, each of those shootings, they're very different. They're very mm-hmm. different situations. And mm-hmm. depending on where you watch the video from, one person could be guilty or the other person could be guilty. So just by editing the video or the angle of the video, it could be very different. There was one video that showed you know, a guy being dragged out of his car and you're watching the video and you're like, oh my God, these cops are going to beat this guy up, aren't they? And then the guy out of nowhere, you can't even see it. He's being pulled out of the car. He's fighting his fight and the cops are being super patient. They don't shoot him. They pull him out and then he kills one of the cops and shoots the other one. And you're like, oh, well, that wasn't the ending I expected. It's like, well, that's what cops face every time they pull somebody over is that possibility that they can have a gun under their waistband or under the seat. So then you watch the next video where a cop is shooting somebody in the back and you're like, oh my God, he shot somebody in the back. It's like, yeah, that person was not listening. And then they went into the wheel well of their car where there was a knife and that could have turned out the same. It could have been a gun, et cetera. And so it's very, it would be very uh, low signal if I just said, you know, uh, these are very gray area situations and really the training of the police officer and the compliance of the individual is really the determining factor. Yeah. Maybe not race, yeah. you know, the training of the police officer and the compliance of the individual. That's actually the factor of, that's going on here. It's maybe not as much of a race issue as it is that training of the police officer and the rules in which they've been t- taught and the person's compliance now, that, that could get me canceled Right. Except on a podcast where I explain it as, you know, generally we should withhold. Well, because nobody's going through the these. transcripts yet to look for reasons to cancel. Right. But that's no, but coming. I mean, even the transcript yeah. of us discussing it is, yeah. you know, it's, it's more nuanced than a tweet. Right. If I were to tweet that, hey, you should really withhold judgment until you have all the facts, because this could be a situation where a cop gets murdered or it could be a situation where a cop murders, uh, and you know, a person in cold blood. Both of those things have occurred in the world. Both mm-hmm. of those things will continue to occur in the world. You know, you, you can't cancel me for saying something as simplistic and obvious as that. Right. But, you know, when these things get charged up, you know, like I, I was looking at the Breonna Taylor one and trying to understand that. And I don't understand what these where these no knock warrants come from. Mm-hmm. Like, why does that even exist? Like, I mm-hmm. could understand it with a, maybe a terrorist and they have mm-hmm. a bomb in the place and, you know, there's a serious concern or, you know, but but even still, wouldn't you want to wait them out? Like if the person is asleep in their house. Mm hmm can't you wait till the morning for when they go out to get a Starbucks and then arrest mm-hmm. them when they're at their car and keep the cops safe? Like, why would the cops want to knock the door in? If the person comes to the door, gets in their car to go to Starbucks, you just pull up, you draw your guns on them, the person puts their hands up and they get, why would you need to kick the door down? It makes no sense, right? So those are the things where the nuance of that discussion cannot occur on social media. And people are afraid to have a nuanced discussion. So when you get this cancel culture happening, Mm -hmm. which is the thing, especially on college campuses, people are afraid to talk about important issues. Intelligent people are really afraid to talk about important issues. So now you remove the intelligent people, you remove the considered people, you remove the thorough people from the discussion because they're just afraid of getting canceled. Right. Like why, people say to me, why would you even bring up this topic? Right. Why would you even go near the third rail? And so, well, I think you can have a reasonable discussion about charged issues. But if you take, most people would not want to comment on it. Yeah. So then who's left? Well, then you have the extremes left and the extremes who are 5% on either side, who are not considered, who are not thinking logically are just saying, well, you know, uh, this was murder or uh, this person didn't comply with the police. Right. And it's like, well, there might be more nuance than that. Like when I saw some of these, I was like, well, why didn't the police officer tackle that person? Like, why did they even let them walk around their car? If they're not complying, why didn't they shoot them with a taser? Why didn't they tackle them? It's like, oh, they did shoot them with a taser. Taser didn't work. So, yeah. and then in other situations, you're like the George Floyd one is like, okay, there's really no reason to sit on somebody's neck for nine minutes. The person's cuffed. And right. if they were on drugs, well, a lot of people are on drugs. Like <laughs> half the audience might be on drugs right now. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah, it's yeah. legal to smoke weed. Like it, it, just because somebody is on drugs doesn't mean you get to sit on their neck, for, uh, kneel on their neck for nine minutes and kill them. So, you know, it would be really great if we could have these discussions. Even healthcare is an important discussion. Yeah. Most people think rich people or companies mm-hmm. and capitalists are against healthcare. Yeah. And it's like, actually, every single person I know who runs a company or a venture capitalist or an investor wants there to be universal healthcare because they want to yeah. decouple healthcare from employment because it'd be better for everybody. But again, social media shuts down the discussions and that's why podcasting is surging because you listen to Sam Harris's podcast or you listen 
you know, to Ben Shapiro's or you mm -hmm. listen to Joe Rogan or you mm -hmm. listen to Rachel Maddow, which, you know, they cross publish. Um, you can really start to you can work out an issue. You can get get into some nuance and get a full context for something. So but let me ask you something. So so, you know, 25 years ago, it wasn't quite like this. You know, there no. was polarization. You know, they, they you can see on a timeline how, you know, the centers of each party have started moving further and further toward the extremes. But it feels like we're reaching a, you know, an apex with all this. And, and I wonder how if, if social media is like public enemy number one on this, do you feel like the implications are starting to ripple through society? Um, I actually think that this is a bit of a pendulum or a okay. house of cards. You know, pick okay. the metaphor you want. Um, I like but pendulum is, better. That's hopeful. Yeah. House of cards well, is think, harder, right? Yeah. Well, I think the pendulum is basically losing velocity and going to wind up in the center. Because if you look yeah. at Joe Biden, he's a centrist, right? Right, right. Um, and I think the Republican Party will become centrist. And I think mm -hmm. people are going to realize if if Trump, in fact, does lose, which it's looking like he's down seven points, but you know, you can't count that guy out and nope. the debate at the taping of this, the debate is tomorrow night. I'm not sure when right. you're publishing. Uh, so we'll, day after, yeah. The day after. So that'll be a very interesting thing to see what when happens. You're gonna, when you're going to turn on the TV or whatever you, however you get your information, and yeah. one side's going to say that Trump won and the other side's going to say that Biden won. Sure, yeah. We, and we so, can predict that right now. But I, I think what will happen is people are going to start to realize, and the pandemic is making people realize this, that being on this crazy train yeah. and being outraged all the time and every issue being on 10 it just burns people out and people want some normalcy. And I think that's you, why Biden's so you, leading. You think is, it has a shelf life? I think it does. I think the being outraged all the time is exhausting. Yeah. And it also doesn't lead to solutions, right? And at a certain point, you know, arguing, protesting, fighting, it's not as rewarding as actually solving the problem. Right. And it's one of the things I love about my job is I as an angel investor in companies, angel, you know, founders are just always looking for a solution. They just mm -hmm. want to implement a solution. They want to solve a problem, whether it's global warming, electric vehicles, making it easy for you to pay something, easier to get a, a, you know, an apartment, an Airbnb, easier to get a taxi, Uber, you know, easier to calm yourself down with meditation and calm.com, easier to trade stocks, Robinhood. Uh, you know, they're just trying to take friction and make yeah. an easier solution for people that solves uh, problems and makes life more delightful. Screaming and yelling and protesting, you know, not uh, as productive. on either side. It's not yeah. as productive as actually solving the problem. Yeah. And I think when the problems become super acute, people are going to start wanting to solve the problem. And if you look at global warming, mm -hmm. I actually think this is actually the moment with these California wildfires that people are starting to say, you know what? Time to start thinking about solutions here. Mm -hmm. um, and then President Trump's insanity is making people say, you know, Time to start thinking about some solutions here for social media. Mm -hmm. So when the system starts to really break down, people complain about it for a decade, but then they eventually, maybe in that second decade, say, let's just solve this problem. And global warming's, by the way, I mean, I, I know the world's leading experts on this, you know, investing companies related to it. I, I get pitched on it constantly. Yeah. We actually have the ability to have sustainable energy and we have the ability to have clean water. And if you have those two things, you have unlimited produce, and nutrients for people. So humanity right now has the technology to have unlimited free produce, fruit, you know, vegetables, grains for everybody on the planet, unlimited for free, and unlimited free energy and unlimited free water, or so cheap that it would be de minimis. So while people are fighting over all this stuff, the technologists have just been refining solar, uh, desalinization, and taking water hyd hydro um, solutions to take water out of the air. These things have all been worked on. And then when you look at produce, produce is just a function of energy and water. It's going to be, if people who are producing produce, and then there's robots, so we're investing in a company right now that's doing robots to pick strawberries. Oh, wow. We're going to, in the next 10 to 20 years, you will see the price of produce go either stay the same while, you know, um, everything else gets more expensive, which is kind of mm -hmm. what's happened, or it will yeah. just dramatically drop in price. And well, that's so going to change the world. So, but how do you keep that from being a Republicans versus Democrats issue, like everything else? Because it well, seems like no matter what happens, pick a story, everybody's fighting, everybody's drawn their yeah. battle lines, and what technology do do? goes on a straight, you know, incremental either Moore's law or just incremental uh, improvement because founders and scientists um, are working on it. So, independent of what political parties in 
it doesn't matter who's in the White House or who's mm -hmm. in the UN or who's running Germany or China. Mm -hmm. Batteries are being produced for smartphones and smartphone chips are being made 25% faster and batteries are being made five or 10% more efficient every year, mm -hmm. year in and year out. And every 18 months, according to Moore's law, you know, CPU is double, even if it wasn't that, even if it was 50% a year, yeah. um, it would still be this amazing, uh, or if it's 25% a year, this amazing march of technology moving on. And the reason why drones or self-driving cars uh, or electric vehicles all became possible was because of battery technology and smartphone technology driving the price of chips down. And as the price of chips go down, as the price of batteries go down and their power goes up, more problems get solved. So this is going to happen independent of the noise of politicians. It happens independent of them. Well, I like your optimism. Go, yeah. go back to social media with me for a second, though. How do you put that back in the box? How, how, do you, how do you walk that back from where it is when that's just, I mean, I feel like we're all in a cockfight and like we, we wanted to be entertained and then we found ourselves like in the, yes, in the cage a, killing each other, right? Yeah. I, how do you change the incentive structure so that social media actually, is it a regulatory thing? Is it? I, I think people will self-police themselves. Um, I think what's going to happen is intelligent people are already taking a break from it Last time I took Twitter and Facebook and Instagram off my phone, I finished my book in like under four months. Oh, wow. So if you want a productivity boost, you just turn these things off. Uh, and people are starting to realize that and people get burnt out from it. And so I think there's a natural um, detox that people will do. Okay. Uh, just like, you know, alcohol and cannabis are freely available, but you don't see people like at 12 in the afternoon with a bottle of vodka and like a huge bong, you know, in the middle of the street getting ripped. <laughs> You're on Zooms with very healthy people. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it, the people had this, you no, know, but like, generally speaking, generally yeah, no, speaking, I, I, I take your point. You, and, I and you're in the Twitter bubble. I'm in the Twitter bubble. Yeah. That's a very unique place to live. Yeah. When you're, when you're in the Twitter bubble, it's sort of like, you're like a heroin addict or something and everybody yeah. you know is a heroin addict. So you're just yeah. talking about heroin all the time and just <laughs> trying to score heroin all the time. And it's like, did you see this trending topic? And then you talk to a civilian who's not on heroin slash Twitter. And they're yes. like, I'm sorry, what trended? And you're like, you didn't see a trend? It trended, like this thing trended. And it's like, that thing trended. And it's like, yeah, no, yeah. I, I didn't see that actually. Yeah. Um, so you just find my out best outside of it. I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm working on the next book and I'm literally about to start my detox. And it's mm. very simple. You just take Twitter and Facebook and Instagram off your phones and you just use them on your desktop. And What's I just the use them about? as a tool. Uh, I'm not saying yet, but it's for founders. Um, okay. But it will, uh, it'll be for, the last one was for investors and founders read it to get intelligence on how investors think about their companies. This won't be for founders and maybe some investors will read it to figure out what great companies are, but basically how to build a great company in the earliest years of your company, now, which I have a lot of experience in after 200 plus investments and investing. Yeah. I'm on a pace right now, 7,500 investments a year. Wow. And most of them fail. So you really start to learn a lot through those failures. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about misinformation, social mm -hmm. media, fake news getting out there, things yep. like that. Is the problem actually misinformation or is the problem incivility? Yeah, those are both definitely issues. I think a lot of the misinformation, like these uh, misinformation campaigns yeah. um, are being run by the Russians and the Chinese and other right. actors right. who, you know, they really would like, if you, if you were to study America, you yeah. study any country and say, what's the weak part? What's the, what's the Achilles heel? Well, for America, yeah. it's obviously race relations, right? We have the terrible mm -hmm. history of slavery. That's right. We've never had reparations. We never really resolved that issue and had an open discussion about race in this country. And you still have some people who kind of believe in the Confederacy and want to keep Confederate flags flying, et cetera. And, you know, it, the, the Russians realize that is our weakest link. Mm -hmm. And so what do they do? They attack it. What's the next weak link for America? Wealth disparity. Mm -hmm. It's not that we have so many poor people in this country. It's that we have so many rich people. Mm. Most countries have many more poor people or people living in poverty than the United States. The issue with the United States is we have the world's richest people because we are free capitalist society has the best outliers, has the Bezoses and the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks. We build companies that become global standards, whether it's Disney, Coca-Cola, Tesla, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. 
our companies, Microsoft, become global phenomenons and other countries don't have that. What Chinese product do you use or Japanese product do you use every day? It's a very short list. What German product do you use every day? Well, maybe you drive a BMW or a Mercedes, like Germans mm-hmm. have made some world-class global dominating products. But what's a product made in the last 20 years from Germany or France or China that you use every day? You probably can't mm-hmm. name one or Japan. Mm-hmm. But America, you could name 20 off the top right. of your head. Right. Well, if you create the world's greatest global products, you will have the world's richest people. We yes. have half of them. And for good reason, our system works. But the Russians and the Chinese, they're doing misinformation campaigns to make you as a non-billionaire feel like a failure. And you are now focused on Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos' wealth and being angry at Jeff Bezos, when in fact, we should be celebrating Jeff Bezos and the fact that he created so many jobs and that he's taking over the world with this incredible product or service or Uber or Airbnb, whatever it is. Because would you rather those be German companies or French companies or English companies or Brazilian companies, Chinese companies, Japanese companies, Australian companies? No. You would rather they be American companies and that we get the taxes and the profits, et cetera. But they know exactly how to spin you up. Race relations and wealth disparity. The reason we have wealth disparity is because we have the richest people in the world, mm-hmm. because we create the best companies in the world. And this little three hundred million dollar, three hundred, um, this little three hundred million um, population country punches way above its weight for some reason. That reason yeah. is the combination of capitalism, democracy, and that rab- that that rugged individualism, and that belief in capitalism, belief in entrepreneurship, belief in founders' ability to change the world that we have. And what they're trying to do, the Russians and the Chinese and et cetera, is they're trying to make us believe that it's a weakness. And mm-hmm. they're trying to dismantle our ability to cherish and love billionaires and capitalists. And it's working. You know, like, look, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are literally their platform was banned the billionaires and the billionaires are the problem in the country. All the other countries are trying to steal our playbook. They're trying to create the next Amazon. They're trying to create the next Uber. They're trying to create the next Google. What's the best way to do that is to get us to, off of our game. They're trying to F with us and get inside our heads and make us believe that that's the problem. That is not the problem in this country. That is not the problem, that those people are so successful. The problem is a lot of the people in the country don't believe they can be successful. Our education system is failing. There are re- they, we don't have health care for everybody. There are reasons that we, uh, or there are things we need to do better. I think yeah. health care for everybody and education being better. Those two things, you solve those two things and you maybe solve race relations, uh, or really help them by having a very honest discussion about reparations, uh, mm-hmm. which I'm in favor of, mm-hmm. um, which I think any reasonable person in America would be in favor of, if you could figure out a way to actually do it. And I've been trying to research that yeah. uh, since we're touching the third rail and like basically walking yeah, yeah, on the third yeah. rail on this podcast. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> I think actually reparations is a really good topic for us to discuss. Yeah. I mean, if any group of people, if the Italians came here and were enslaved, it wouldn't be such a big deal to say, hey, maybe Italians, we need to think about what happened to them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when it comes to black people in America and African-Americans being enslaved, we have a hard time discussing reparations. Why is that such a hard thing to discuss? Yeah. They, they got the worst treatment, uh, as well as indigenous people here, uh, Native Americans. We need to make it right. And we can mm-hmm. make it right. We have tons of resources. So w- what is the best path to make it right? I've heard some people say just straight up reparations cash. I've heard other people have really creative solutions. What if if you were African-American, you had access for some period of time, this reparations period, mm-hmm. to higher education? What if you mm-hmm. had business, small business loans available? These seem like really great things to consider. Don't we want to heal this wound? If we want to heal this wound, let's heal it. And let's have yeah. an open discussion about now, what let, would actually heal Let me ask you a question, though. Let me ask you a question. Can you have a discussion like that without it devolving to where, as you said, the 5% mm-hmm. on both sides say, well, absolutely not. I would never, you know, what are you talking yeah. about? There is no problem. And then on the other side, yes, it's never going to be enough. So how do you? Very simple. You just make fun of it and ignore those people. I do it all day long on Twitter. When okay. somebody comes at me and they're obviously a Russian bot, I'm like, you have 16 followers. You created your account three months ago. You're uh-huh. a Russian bot account. Tell Putin uh-huh. I said, hi. I literally <laughs> screenshot their profile page and I say, tell Putin I said, hi. I know you're a spam account or you're some troll. So, you know. Um, and, and just make fun of them. And then on the left, when people are hysterical and they're just like, you know, uh, technology and capitalism is the worst thing ever. I'm like, and then I just reply back, set a person using their smartphone on Twitter uh, on a high speed connection, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> See, but the problem is, the problem is that that bot has the ability to reach 
as many people as they want effectively. And and so so let me ask you a question. Is journalism well, if you integrity? just make fun of them, I think making yeah. fun of them is the best thing to do. Look, no, but I think listen, making fun of hysterical people or trolling yeah, people yeah, is the yeah, way to no. go. Listen, I mean, I think just holding up a mirror to people is kind of what you're doing. And I think that yeah. that's constructive. But but how do you scale that? Right. How do you get everybody that doesn't even realize? I, I think, honestly, that that's I know it sounds happening. stupid, but yeah. podcasting is a great, a great platform. You know, podcasting, podcasting here, you and I world. having. Yes, I do think podcasting save the world, because if you're having a considered discussion like this, mm -hmm. and you hear people's tone of voice, you look in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to look at this conversation and say, oh, it's two white guys who are racist. They're going to say, no, it's two white guys. Yes. Obviously, correct. But they're actually having a considered discussion, yeah, about race, about social media. There, there, there's nothing here that you could cancel us over. Whereas if we tweeted little snippets of this conversation, yes, people could try to trend it and cancel it. Um, and so I, I love the idea of more discourse amongst people who disagree with each other. You know, I, mm -hmm. I will listen to Rachel yes. Maddow, who's yes. a little further left than I am. Yeah. And then I'll listen to Ben Shapiro, who is way further right than I am. Yes. And then I'll listen to Joe Rogan or Sam Harris, yep. who might be, you know, Sam is kind of left leaning, actually more than people give him credit for. And Joe okay. might be a little more right leaning. And then I'll listen to Tim Ferriss, everybody in between. Um, I'll listen to Still Processing, great uh, podcast um, by two gay, black, New York Times culture writers mm -hmm. and it's an amazing podcast it gives me like a lot of great perspective that mm -hmm. i wouldn't normally have about black culture and so i i think you can really open the aperture by listening to other people who have different opinions I, I really love a podcast by brett easton ellis yeah who is a gay you know 80s magazine writer and author of less than zero and uh american psycho and it's a good geez, podcast to sponsor as well yeah, and I mean, he he's um, I, I think he went behind a paywall now. I pay for it. And then Red Scare is another one with these crazy, like I guess they call them the dirtbag left, okay. which is like this crazy, like Lower East Side, you know, two women who are Russian origin. I don't okay. think they're spies <laughs> or it's, misinformation. They're just kind of like hipsters. Yeah. But I, I listen to very different people than myself. I try to yes. listen to a, a range of people mm -hmm. and life is more interesting. You so you feel like yeah, you, people, but, but because you have the freedom to do that, it sounds like your position is that the free market, just giving people open access, eventually they'll get sick and tired of getting sick and tired and they'll start seeking a more balanced perspective. That's where I yes. hear you coming down on this, which is 100%. really interesting. And, and man, I feel like it's trending in the right direction. Look, yeah, you asked, I asked you to be on my podcast. A great yeah. discussion. You asked me to be on your podcast. Yes. This is all happening yes. over and over again. And then my yeah. friends were like, Hey, will you do a podcast with, Jamal was like, hey, will you do a podcast with me? I was like, sure, we'll call it all in. Then we brought one of our friends in. Then we brought the other yeah. friend in. And yeah. now we've got this regular discussion where people who are right wing, who are scientists, who are capitalists, all talking about issues. Yeah. Uh, the more we talk about it, the more we listen to each other. I think yes. the better off we'll be. Yes. I think Trump, global warming, and like a lot of these acute issues are going to mm -hmm. make our nation stronger once we, um, you know, it, Trump's just like a like this really. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me hear you try to explain. Okay. <laughs> Trump is tremendous. Okay. Nobody. There beat. you go. There it's you go. It's going to crush Biden in the debates. Okay. Uh -huh. On par Sleepy with Joe, you low you energy. Okay. Do you do a Biden? I don't do a Biden. He's hard to work on a Biden. I'm going to work on a Biden. Kind of Biden sounds like this to me, but I know that's not him. But it kind of no, comes No, no, you're not like there yet. You're, you're further along on the other two. I got to work on the Biden. Working on your Biden. Yeah. But, you know, I think. What we'll we'll look back on Trump and like it's this very weird thing that happened yeah. where a lot of people felt disenfranchised. So why did they feel disenfranchised? He was a media savant and he had probably some Russian help. And you'll put all that together and it'll be like, okay, that was a weird thing that happened in our democracy. We all got a major civics lesson. He stress tested how the government works. Yeah. How because a lot of our government works. So this on is an norms. anomaly. This is not the new normal. I think we it's don't an just anomaly go from a right. Trump to a left, Trump to a right. The, the Republicans did not want him anywhere near their party. Right. And everybody knows he's on the left. He's pro-choice. He's a New York liberal. Like, he has nothing to do with the right. The guy is 100% pro-choice. Uh, he is not, and but, you know, he wanted to win. 
Yeah. It was like, um, but it was also like a marketing exercise, according to Cohen, that he wanted to start this television thing, yeah. television network, and he didn't think he was going to win. So he didn't think he was going to win. The Republicans didn't want him to win. He won. Okay, fine. Um, it was a very weird thing that happened. It stress tests the entire system. It's going to become a civics lesson for a hundred years. Like, remember, like, just like Nixon was like, yeah. hey, people, you could put somebody in office who could do criminal stuff and who could be really crazy like Nixon. And then there'll be Trump as another example. And then maybe we get back to normalcy because how are the Republicans ever going to win as a party? Their party demographics are getting so small right. that Trump just barely threaded the needle on that electoral college. It's going to get harder and harder them. So really what the Republicans need to do is embrace some amount of reasonable immigration, mm -hmm. uh, some focus on poverty, uh, some po for a focus on jobs. I mean, they're, and healthcare. If they don't change their position on healthcare and immigration, I don't think they can win ever again because the entire country is pro uh, immigration and pro healthcare. So I well, think they're going to wind up losing. They're professional politicians, though. They'll move. Yeah. But I, I think they're going to move to like this more centrist kind of place. Um, and even gun control. Like people really would like some reasonable gun control. Yeah. So there's a concept of getting to Denmark, which is um, does in Denmark, the people who are in office, reflect in a very high correlation what the will of the people is. Right now, yeah. it doesn't feel like that. Like yeah. we're, we're really against choice and we're really against reasonable gun control. Actually, that's not the case. M majority of people are pro-gay uh, marriage, pro-cannabis um, uh, legalization. They're pro-reasonable gun control and they're pro-choice. So why is the country all wound up you know, not an alignment with what the majority of people think. And I think it was just weird moment with Trump, but I, I think you'll see a Republican party where the boomers start to leave and it becomes Gen X millennials. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about global warming. And we're both very optimistic because the boomers are all retiring. Like mm -hmm. Trump and the boomers, like they're going to be dead this soon. This kind of last stand, yeah. This is their last stand. And yeah. then Gen X kind of takes over and, you know, the, the high end of Gen X is 60 years old right now, and the low end is 45. Like, now Gen X is going to finally take over. And I would say 80%, 90% of Gen Xers believe in global warming and want to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, a third of boomers believe in it or something. And certainly that will change everything. Because Gen Xers are going to look at their millennial kids or Gen C kids, and they're not going to want to disappoint them. Whereas well, so the boomers had no problem disappointing us Gen Xers. Yeah. No, this is refreshing because I think it's one of the most optimistic views we've had anybody bring to the program. I mean, I think so much of what's been going on, and by the way, good documentary uh, beyond uh, our social dilemma is uh, Stars and Strife, which came wow. out about a month or two ago. We're having the director on um, next week. And, uh, you know, it, it basically shows how we're all kind of pitted against each other. And he's got, you know, he's got Leon Panetta and James Baker and, mm. you know, our uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel. And, and you've got some real heavy hitters on this thing, but they're really setting up what the problem is. And, and everybody starts with social media, but then it's also the political system uh, is such that you are incentivized to win elections more so than you're incentivized to get things done and to yep. compromise. I mean, the fact that they couldn't get this thing done in Congress uh, to pass a new relief. Bill, Crazy. What, Crazy. Yeah, I mean, they cannot work with each other right now, but I think yeah. what you're saying is eventually the marketplace voters are yeah. going to get tired of this and there's going to 100 self-correct and that's a very yeah. very optimistic view that you know means we may not be on the verge of social and economic collapse so that's very positive uh i think there's a clear path also out of the pandemic like if you look at the company you know the companies i've invested in you know i, I talked to the founders about what their plans were during the pandemic and almost universally the plans were um, people maybe did a little bit of belt tightening or didn't hire as many people. Yeah. Uh, so they stopped hiring or they let go, you know, in the case of Airbnb, I'm not an investor, but they let go of a third of the staff, I think. So mm -hmm. you had these like big cuts. Then you had people say, we're not going to do real estate anymore. We're going to have a large amount of people working from home and yeah. we're going to let people work from wherever they want so they can work yeah. remote. So on a, on a corporate and a personal balance sheet level, everybody's balance sheet got cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And everybody reassessed what they wanted out of life. So how many people do you know who moved out of a city, 
Yeah. And then set and can't shut up about the fact that they pay, they don't pay state tax or yeah. they are, their house cost a million dollars instead of 4 million or 400,000 instead of, you know, 1 million and that their cost of living got cut in half while they kept the same salary. Yeah. So if a bunch of people correct their balance sheets, personal balance sheets, then they have more money to spend, more discretionary spending. Mm -hmm. If a bunch of companies uh, correct their balance sheet and then they grow out of the pandemic because they've lowered their cost basis and then they start hiring people around the world or around the country because they don't need to hire them in a city, hiring you know, an operations person in San Francisco might mean 70, 80, 90,000. Hiring an operations person in Toronto or Miami or Austin or Phoenix might be 40, 50, 60,000. So yeah. you might get one and a half staff or three staff for the price of every two in San Francisco, or maybe even two for one I've heard from some mm -hmm. companies. And they're like, you know what? We're going to do more with less cost. That makes more profits, which means more investing. So that's why you have this weird thing going on with the stock market where the stock market is surging right. while you have restaurants and people in travel really hurting in that unemployment. Um, and then I think the pandemic, there is a clear path out of it that is so amazing that people believing this is a permanent pandemic are going to be shocked when they have a home testing kit for $15 and they can test anybody coming into their home and get a result in 10 minutes, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I, I, I had, I've acquired some of these testing kits I'll give uh -huh. you that, and I'm acquiring one of the machines. These are all coming in the next month or two. Uh -huh. So you will know somebody by Thanksgiving who has a testing kit, who when you come for Thanksgiving, you'll be in the driveway, you'll test yourself, you'll get the all clear, you'll go in and hug grandma. The next person comes, they'll get tested. Oh, they have COVID. They'll go home. Person will hand them a testing kit and say, hey, test yourself two more times uh, over the next two weeks. And when you're clear of this, we'll let you back in the house. And then once everybody's doing mass testing for $10 Everybody will be able to go back to offices or if you want to go to a concert or you want to take a flight. Uh, United just did a deal with Color Genomics and Color is coming on the podcast, uh, my podcast, to mm -hmm. talk about it. They're going to be giving first class and business class a free test if they want it. Really? What's the benefit of taking a free test? Well, if you go to Hawaii or Taiwan or Hong Kong or Japan or wherever you're going, Australia, you wouldn't have to quarantine if you took that test when you got on the flight and you have proof of it. You wouldn't have to wow. quarantine for two weeks. Okay, guess what? Are they going to get back. that up before flight costs go back up? Because that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. I think what they're going to do is then it will become mandatory. Yeah. And so step one, you give it for free to the premium passengers. Step two will be they'll give it for free to everybody. And then, you know, like 9-11, we all started going to the airport 90 minutes before the flight and it was no big deal. Like we used to get to airports 30 minutes before the flight, no big deal. Then yeah. it became 90 minutes. This will be part of the process. You'll get to the airport, you'll take the test, you'll go through security. It's going to, it's going to, the, and once you have that, then you can do test and tracing because you have so many tests going on. You know, right now we've been stuck at like 800,000 tests a day. Mm -hmm. That's about to get the doors blown off and go to 10 million a day, I believe. And once you get to 10 million, it's going to be kind of stupid. People are going to be like, come over for dinner. And they'll be like, uh, did, you, did you take a test? It's like, yeah, I took one on Wednesday. I took one on last Sunday. Do you want me to take another one? And they're going to be like, yeah, no, don't worry about it. Um, so once you have that testing going on regularly, yeah. Then when pockets break out, like in Korea, they had a pocket breakout because they, I don't know if you remember their second wave was like 150 people got it because one tourist came from France, I believe, and then yeah. went to like five bars in one night. <laughs> All five like, bars. Because they got happen people. to go bar hopping. Yeah. He, literally one <laughs> selfish person. One close talker broke, goes bar hopping and the whole and town And he broke quarantine. Out. He yeah. was supposed to be in quarantine for two weeks. And he's like, yeah, I feel like maybe I'll go to a bar. I feel fine. It's like, don't you understand the concept of asymptomatic? <laughs> we have to spell that out to you? <laughs> like, yeah. You don't have symptoms, but you do have it. So anyway, I think the pandemic solved yeah. by Q1. Yeah. I think the economy comes roaring back. Unemployment drops. I think Biden wins. Reasonableness comes back to politics. Oh, you're calling it And already. global warming uh, becomes a top issue that everybody takes seriously over the next two or three years. And what we proved during the pandemic was that humans staying at home and not using cars yes. can clean the skies. And- you know, we can actually, humans can have an impact. We had this like weird thing, humans can never have an impact. And then we had the pandemic and all of a sudden, you know, global warming pumps the brakes because, oh, we're not all using as much carbon. We can sequester carbon with algae and, and um, seaweed. We can go to clean energy and solve it. We can solve it with nuclear. I, I don't know, like we just need to have the will to do these things. Mm -hmm. And if you look at pan the pandemic, if we had the will to deploy this technology at scale, we would already be through it in America, just like other countries are. 
With global warming, if we have the will, we can do it. And with politics, if we have the will, we can demand that our representatives have reasonable discussions about getting to Denmark, getting to representing what the majority of us want. And what the majority of us want is to be free, to pursue our dreams, get a great education, have health care, and raise our families. It's a very simple thing that all Americans want. Freedom, opportunity, health care, education. That's the long and short of it. Everything else, I think, is secondary to those core issues. Let mm -hmm. me be free to do what I want and say what I want, stay out of my life, except when it comes to health care and education. And then I want you up in my life providing that you know, basic service to me. Why this is not the topic of your next book, I don't understand. Because, <laughs> no, I'm telling you. Politics this is, will be my third act. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, my but, it's, act. but it's people, right? And it's solutions. Yeah. And that's your business. And I, and I feel yeah. like, and, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to milk you it's for It's not a bad minute. idea, actually. Solutions yeah. would be a good, finding I mean, solutions on, to problems would be a great topic for a book for me. I thank you yeah. for that. Cut well, this out. I, you know what? Cut this section out of the pocket so we don't take yeah. it off on the third yeah, well, book. You, at least it's <laughs> a platform. If you want to learn more, you have to buy the book. But exactly. no, you know, there. Sure. so listen, a couple things. I, you yeah. know, I, there's still a few things I want to cover with you. Okay. Uh, we, I want to talk Lightning about round. capitalism. Yeah, I, I want to talk about these things. Um, I have to do some business with the audience very quickly here. And, mm -hmm. and that is, um, number one, if you like what we're doing, if you like this conversation, you believe it's helping, um, please subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. Also visit OxfordRoad.com. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. We'll give you industry updates and thought leadership and everything like that. Now, one thing that's much more important than that, and it's a, it's an issue that I think has been highlighted uh, throughout the pandemic, and that is the 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 problem of isolation and what happens when people are not connected to other people and how damaging that is. This is something that um, is is going to carry on far beyond when we have the pandemic under control at children's hospitals across the country, where you have you have infants with life-threatening medical conditions, getting the medical care that they need in this country. And yet in between that, they don't have enough people to hold the babies. They, 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 parent, you have working parents, you have single parents, people that cannot be there all the time for one reason or another. And you get kids in a bed and the nurses are busy attending to the medical needs of the kids. So we experienced this when, when my youngest uh, was born. She was in Children's Hospital for about six months. We saw the problem. My wife and I agreed we were going to try to help out. And so we started something called the Koala Corps. The Koala Corps doesn't touch money, but directs money to children's hospitals so that they can actually hire staff for a program. They need somebody who can vet, train, manage, schedule the volunteers. And there's a ton of volunteers. A lot of people want to help with this. There's nothing in the middle to facilitate that and make it happen. So when you give to Children's Hospital via the Koala Corps, you help solve this problem. And I just want to invite you to go to koalacorps.com. That's K-O-A-L-A-C-O-R-P-S.com. And we're there back with Jason. There we have Koala, it. Koala Corp. Yes. Wait. C O R P S. Okay. I love koalas. Do you? Yeah. I uh, my daughter took a picture with one. Um, Maybe we in, can use uh, that. Uh, in um, on a place called Hamilton Island, which is out in the Great at the bottom of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Koala. Can you spell it for me one more time? K O A L A. K O. A. A L A yeah. C O R P S dot okay. com. Koalacorps.com. Awesome. This is great. So you can donate to this. Yes. All right. I'm go ahead and donate two grand right now. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jason. It's okay. I'm rich. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, we uh, appreciate it. It it does matter. It's uh, it's really really important to us. So thank you for that, and and thank you for making sure that I rearticulated the spelling because people may not have caught. Well, it. you know, it goes. I always do this on the podcast. I always, and especially with advertisers, I always yeah, make sure yeah. I spell it twice because people are listening, and I want to make sure that when they're typing it, they hear me say it twice. So just so everybody's clear, K O A L A Corpse C O R P S dot com, right. and uh, I just went and sent. 2k and donation thank you jason that is really really cool. great i mean i think one of the, it's one of the things i love about the internet is you get many hands making for light work um a lot of people just donate you know 100 bucks each and you get 100 mm -hmm. people to do that or a thousand people to donate 20 bucks each all of a sudden you could change somebody's life or solve a problem and 
everybody is such a victim and -hmm. everybody is so passive and Mm -hmm. they're so cynical. And then you just see these amazing moments where somebody says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be not cynical for a minute. I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to put up a web page. I'm going to put up yeah. a, a tweet or a blog post or a podcast ask and just see if I can help some people. And I teach a course called angel.university. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't need to make money from teaching people how to be angel investors. So I said, hey, donate a hundred bucks and uh, you can come to the course, three hour course. And these are all accredited investors, rich people. And, you know, like 50 people would sign up, 100 people. So I'd give 5,000, 10,000 to charity. Then we started advertising and we said, hey, we'll give all the proceeds, all the profits. Yeah. Um, and then we actually did some marketing on it. And then all of a sudden we started getting fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in donations. Uh. And I do it every month. And we've done $90,000 in donations. And I, well, 92 now, because I just gave you 2K. Okay. And basically my team is stoked to come to work every day because every month we're giving 1K, 2K, 3K away to people. And, you know, it adds up. It adds up. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, little little gifts like this. So we're, we're doing a big thing with Chromebooks right now. Uh-huh. And there's a website called Donors Choose. And you can go on Donors Choose and you can search for teachers who are looking for grants. Uh-huh. And you can choose uh, people who are uh, in communities that are uh, in need, uh, mm-hmm. you know, poor communities, essentially. And uh, you just search for poor communities where they're looking for Chromebooks and mm-hmm. they... Uh, don't have any donations. So I look for the teachers who have no donations mm. and I just give them their first 500 bucks, right? That's you do 10 beautiful. of those in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels fucking great, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Because, you know, you, that you, teacher's you see sitting what it's there. Doing. You, know what you're, you know what it's doing. It's not going to some fund where they're going to pay administration no. costs for 90% so, of it and you're actually making an impact. Yeah, it's not paying for some office for a bunch right. of like nonprofit do-gooders, no offense, yeah, yeah. who are living high on the hog and then giving yeah. 30 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar. This is like 100% of the dollars going yeah. to the right person. It's beautiful. And what I'm, I specifically like to do is be that first donation yeah. so that the person wakes up that morning and they're like, oh, I put that thing up last week and nobody even noticed. And also it's a 500. Whoa. Okay. I just bought myself two of the eight Chromebooks I'm trying to get for, you know, Oakland or East Palo Alto, um, you know, schools. Um, just came up with the title for this episode, which is Jason okay. Kalkanis is saving the world. <laughs> um, I, well, I'll tell you what, this is one of the more uplifting, uh, uh, I think we've ever had. So, um, yeah. we're going to play the unsolicited advice game now where you're oh. going to tell people who, who, who did not ask for your views exactly what they should do. And you get to do it in a tweet size format, which we I love it. it is 20 seconds. Okay. Got it. So I'm going to time I'm ready. You. And the okay. first one you're going to give advice to is Donald Trump. Market Donald cycle. Trump, uh, resign and enjoy <laughs> your epic life. Get a pardon and get back on the golf course. Okay, very good. Joe Biden. Uh, stay focused, don't back down. Speak your mind, be honest and upfront and be fair to everybody. And, and, and be, pull people in from other side of the aisle. Be, yeah. be extra kind to Republicans and include them in your decisions and process. Very good, very beautiful. Very much in line with the spirit of the program. Okay, marketers, marketers, what do we have to do with this? Markets marketers, um, be honest about your value proposition in the world and be generous in engaging with your customers. Your customer's opinion of you is ultimately what will determine your success in life. So cherish and delight your customers and be honest with them and supportive at all times. Very good. Okay. Media professionals. Market set go. Oh, if yeah. you want to late stage journalism. For late stage journalists, pick if you want to be an advocate or a journalist and be clear about that at the top of your articles. If you're a journalist, you should come into every article with an open mind and let the facts determine what you write. If you're an opinion or advocacy person, put advocacy opinion at the top or go work for an advocacy or opinion blog or newsletter or Substack or podcast. But don't, please do not put your opinions and your spin and your little jabs and Uh. into what is supposed to be reportage. Reporting should be reporting, opinion should be opinion. Too much of the reporting feels like it's got an agenda today on both sides of the aisle. 
this turned into a tweet storm, but it was worth it. Sorry, it was to, worth you, it. No, 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 no. I went double. We're, I went double. And, and I'm going to pick. Yeah, as soon as we're done with this, I'm picking right back up there with you. Okay, <laughs> next one. Republicans, go. Um, Republicans, take back your party and get back to fundamentals: personal freedom, less spending, and open your minds on immigration and healthcare. Beautiful. Okay, Democrats, go. Stop being hysterical filibusters and listen to the other side and treat them with respect, not contempt. Your lips to God's ears. Okay, America, uh, the American citizenry. America has unlimited potential, is the greatest country in the world, and you have unlimited upside as an American and should appreciate it. You could have been born in China. You could have been born in Hong Kong. You could have been born in Russia, Iran. Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, where you're would really have limitations. And there is no false equivalency between those authoritarian countries and this great country. This country has unlimited potential and a limited opportunity, even if it doesn't feel that way, or if the media and the Russian bots are spinning it. It's Wonderful. a great country. Be, and be glad you're here and love yes. this country. Yes. Co- I mean, it literally is the greatest country in the world still. Yes. It still is. And yes. you're the and you're the and reason you're saying it can that be from great. San Francisco. People didn't know. <laughs> the Bay Area, yes. to feel that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the big problem is people don't believe in the American dream when the American dream has never been stronger. They well, actually I, believe the American dream is not strong. I, I you worry. can go onto yeah. YouTube and learn any skill. You can go onto edX and Coursera and take every course at Stanford and MIT for free right now. There is a clear path for you for free to learn any skill you want. And then if you want to start a company, nobody could stop you. Whereas in every other country, they'll find a ways to stop you. Okay, if you could pick one person that you could write in and they would be the president, any living mm. person, who is it? Mm. 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 That is a good question. I think it through. <sighs> I would love to have seen Oprah mm-hmm. and Mike Bloomberg run together. That would have been a dream ticket for me. That's a dream so team. I will go with Oprah and Bloomberg. Okay. That's my dream ticket. Okay, I love it. Um, I'm going to pick right back up where you left off with the media. Because Have you seen the media bias chart? I have not. <laughs> oh, Google it. Okay, media Ad bias chart. Media. Yeah, our last episode, we, we had the creator on. This thing went viral. And uh, Vanessa Otero, um, I'm talking to everybody about this. I think it's so compelling. And not that it's perfect, but just that it's starting to happen. Ah, this is cool. Yeah. So on the left, you have Wonkette, Palmer Report, Daily Kos. Yep. In the middle, you have AP Reuters, ABC Bloomberg. And on the right, you have InfoWars. Yeah, that's interesting. Media yeah, well, bias and, chart, 5.1, May 2020 edition I'm looking at. But And on the Y axis, so go left to right, okay, obviously on the X and on the Y, you've got fact reporting down to fake news, right? Yes. And, oh, and, that's interesting. I just yeah. noticed that part. So yeah. the red at the bottom is just fake news craziness. Yeah. And so they're saying talk- Wonkat and Palmer report on the left is kind of almost fake news mm-hmm. or selectively or incomplete propaganda. story, unfailing propaganda, propaganda contains misleading info or borders on unfair persuasion mm. and complete stories. So the 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 question I Where's the is- New York Times? Oh, look at the New York Times. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're yeah. yeah, they they do not they're skewing left, right? And so what they do is they have three people evaluate a news publication. One person's on the right, one's on the left, one's in the center. And they take a sample of, of mm. stories they've created and they evaluate them based on a, a pretty objective scorecard. But, you know, to me, the, the important thing is it, it's, it's a good symbolism, of, a, a good symbol of the problem. Yes. And that people don't even realize that they're being fed something that's coming from a particular point of view. They just think it's, well, that's, you know, we all get to create these bubbles to feed ourselves whatever we want to hear. And whether or not that's accurate, whether or not it's intellectually honest, whether or not it's, it's on one side of the fence, people don't necessarily know that. And so what I'm hoping is, like you were talking about something for journalists, that you'd like to see them actually identify, is this an opinion piece or is this a reporting piece yeah. and take different approaches? Because I don't know that the the media consuming public really sees a line of demarcation anymore. And I want to know yeah, what I you mean, think it, about that. I mean, if you look at Vox and CNN, it's a mm-hmm. kind of, I was looking at this trying to see how accurate I think it is. And if yeah. you look, like I do think Vox and CNN 
-hmm. Like nobody expected Vox to be objective. And what you see here is they're saying complex analysis or mix of fact reporting and analysis, which is I think what Vox has and Huffington Post and the and Vice, they kind of and Atlantic, they kind of selectively mix in their analysis with their reporting. Whereas mm -hmm. AP and Reuters keep it very like straight. And then yep. as you go in between them, you have Washington Post, The Guardian, and The New York Times, which feel like they're balancing between those two. Straight rep reportage from AP Reuters. And then you know below that, you have Vox and uh, Vice. And then below that, you have this like MSNBC and Slate, which are hysterical and unreliable um, and just totally biased. But on the right, you have a similar thing happening with Newsmax and Epoch Times and the New York Post. It, it's actually, this feels actually somewhat accurate. I'm looking for BBC on here and they didn't it's put- coming. The, they're, they've only got a hundred or 200. I would like to see the so BBC far. on here. I yeah. also think The Economist feels, I guess they do analysis, but they are very neutral. It's really interesting. The Economist is almost like the demarcation point of to the left is Newsweek and Vox and to the right is the Wall Street Journal and the Hill. That actually feels accurate. This feels pretty accurate, actually. Okay, so listen, I, I know I have a, a promise to get you out of here in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to yeah. take like 12 questions and consolidate it into one. Okay, so you've <laughs> got this idea of stakeholder capitalism, right? And, yep. and I don't know if you feel like that's legitimately the future or if that is you know, virtue signaling and just trying to like an insurance policy to get people off their backs. But the, my question is this, we both acknowledge polarization is a problem in this country. Mm. What is a corporation's duty if you truly believe that you are beholden to your stakeholders and not just profit? Do you have a duty to do something to walk it back? And if so, what can they do? You know, stakeholders means, just so people understand. Yeah. Shareholders are part mm -hmm. of stakeholders, mm -hmm. but it used to be that shareholders were the only people who mattered. You had to serve your shareholders. And that was like a real capitalist view. What stakeholders mean is the employees count, the customers count, mm -hmm. and um, maybe the people around your business, which could be a distributor, it could be somebody who sells you parts, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your law firm or, you know, the people who sell. But, but the other, the two stakeholders who really matter in this equation are the employees and the customers. And so if you are the New York Times, the shareholders matter, but also the people who work at the company and the readers also matter. So great companies always thought this way. What this means is at the corporate level, when you make a decision, okay, we are going to give the CEO a pay increase. How does that how does that, you used to just put it through the lens of the CEO wants $10 million more a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that in the shareholders best interest? Well, this is a high performing CEO. So going from 10 to 20 million, if they add a hundred million in revenue, well, that's only 10% of the hundred million incremental profits. So yeah, we should give it to that person. Um, but then you'd say, well, is that fair to the other employees? And is that fair to the readers of the publication at the New York times? Let's say the New York times makes it well for the readers who cares, like doesn't affect them. Oh, for the other employees? Oh, maybe it does. Maybe it does impact morale. Okay, so if we're going to give that person a 2x pay raise, maybe we should look across the board and you know, have 10% raises across the board or at least 10 million if we're adding it to the CEO that we should add 20 million to the other 2,000 employees and, and spread that across. So that would be an example. Mm -hmm. And I think this was already occurring, mm -hmm. but people are starting to think about the board's fiduciary responsibility, legal, ethical, moral responsibility, all of those things wrapped up. Should it be to stakeholders or shareholders? Previously, it was shareholders only, and that was the ultimate test. Now, people are saying, let's make all stakeholders uh, part of it. I, I, think it's, I think it's something people kind of did already. But well, uh, yeah, Silicon Valley, you're kind of like, yeah, that's what, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I right. mean, you really, if you think about human capital, you really yeah. do have to take that into account. The, the yeah. example that would be really uh, prescient here would be Amazon and warehouse mm -hmm. workers. Mm -hmm. So, or Apple and the store workers, because the store workers kind of get treated as second class citizens at Apple. Like they don't get the same benefits, they don't get the same options, whatever. And so they were kind of getting treated poorly, uh, not terribly, but not great. So it certainly didn't feel like they were Apple employees and they Apple corrected that because they were getting so much slack. You can look it up online, but they were getting paid less than, you know, target a Walmart people, I believe at one point, and they got called out for, you know, Apple employees at the store. It's the most profitable store ever. Should get. And then, you know, look at Bezos, you know, he, I think he moved everybody up to $15 an hour in the warehouses. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's a free market. He's paying double the federal 
minimum wage. That felt a lot better. Yeah. Um, and then they were like, everybody wants to get paid more money. So asking people like, do you feel you're underpaid? Well, 100% of people should feel underpaid. Right. They should want more money. Like that's just right, the right. human condition. Uh, right. Or at least the, the overwhelming majority. So if you ask anybody if they're underpaid, they're going to say, yes, I feel underpaid at this point. Yeah. Um, so I do think looking at it in context, there's an incredible uh, competition for entry level, you know, low wage positions right now, you know, between mm -hmm. Uber and DoorDash fighting for the same people who are working at the retail stores is post pre-pandemic and it will be post-pandemic the same thing. Mm -hmm. versus people working for Amazon and the warehouses. Like there was this rabid uh, fight for those individuals and you saw salaries going up past the minimum wage. So that's a really good sign that you have a fun high functioning economy. We had a very high functioning economy, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, with that competition for low wage workers. Entry level, if entry level workers are, have choice, that's a really great sign. If they could choose between Target, Starbucks, Amazon, Uber, Postmates, Etc. That's a really good sign for the economy. Yeah, yeah. and I think so, we, we, we I think we didn't take we we took it for granted. Yeah, people so, were complaining more than ever when we had the lowest unemployment ever in our lifetimes. Yes, it was really weird. I was I would bring that up with these like talking about the crazy left. I would bring this up with the crazy left. I'm like, do you realize we have the lowest unemployment in history, and that people are moving from job to job to job because of this gig economy giving so much flexibility and competition. The gig economy was forcing the Amazons and the shift work targets, Walmarts to raise their offering. Yeah. They were forcing them to do that. Yeah. And that was like, that's a healthy economy. And still it wasn't enough for these crazy left, you know, historical left. <laughs> um, Jason. So connect the dots. Go. Can they help yeah. with polarization? Can who help with polarization? If corporations are, oh. are adopting stakeholder capitalism, yes, do they have course. a duty? Yes. So, yes. so, so, how how do we? Uh, bottom line um, is, how do we? What I do we think do? not bending to special interests constantly. I think people get like a little bit, you know, like a, you know, I don't agree with Ben Shapiro, mm -hmm. but if you were like, you know, this orthodox Jewish Harvard kid has mm -hmm. an opinion about premarital sex or whatever, yeah. you you kind of like. Say, okay, you know, it's got some religious beliefs that I don't agree with. I, I don't agree with my Catholic upbringing, you know, uh, same thing, you know, on contraception or whatever it is. It doesn't mean you have to cancel him, you know, yeah. like it yeah. doesn't mean you have to call their advertisers and try to put them out of business. Yes. Um, but I, I do think that this trying to cancel people culture, the, the yeah. corporations should say, like sort of like what Spotify is going through with Joe Rogan right now, right. which we knew would happen. Right. Which is, listen, Joe Rogan is a talk show where he talks about a range of issues. If he talks for three or four hours, he might misspeak sometimes. Yes. He might evolve his position and we have room for that. That doesn't yeah. mean we're going to have Alex Jones on the network who is, yeah. you know, getting sued for saying that Who's people- bottom left on the, yeah, or bottom exactly. right on the- So right. you could have a little bit of space in your- you know, uh, ability to ex the Overton window, as we talked about, you mm -hmm. could have a little bit of space for, yeah, maybe Ben Shapiro, you know, has a problem with, you know, uh, or hasn't reconciled his feelings on premarital sex or babies out of wedlock. And, yeah. and maybe his positions are, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit edgy on some, or maybe Joe Rogan's too open-minded or made a mistake during a three and a half hour conversation and he misspoke and wants to change what he said the corporations do not need to cancel everybody so quickly. Yeah. There are people who deserve to be canceled like Harvey Weinstein or whatever yep. it happens to be like those are clear cut cases. Yes. But maybe a little bit of room for a difference of opinion yes. before the corporations pull their advertising yes. off of Tucker Carlson or somebody on the left or somebody on the right. Like you could have a little bit of room for a difference of opinion. I think uh, here, be here. Fine. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. do we want to get to this point at which, you know, a person can't evolve their position. You know, I think people's position on transgender individuals is a perfect example today. Mm -hmm. And people's position on gay marriage was the perfect example 10 or 20 years ago. 20 years ago, majority of people were not in favor of gay marriage and we let people evolve and yeah. realize that it's beautiful if people wanna get married, it doesn't matter if they're gay or straight, who cares? Everybody's deserving of respect. Everybody's deserving of love. Everybody's deserving of being married. And we kind of let people get there. And now with trans issues, 
Uh, some people are still living, you know, 10 or 20 years ago where somebody who was trans, it was, it was considered, it was in the DSM-3, I believe, as like a malady, as like a, a, a psychological disorder. It's obviously not a psychological disorder. It's obviously a choice people are making. They want to live in, as a different gender. That's got to be a difficult decision to make. It's got to be a challenging life. We should open our hearts mm-hmm. and be very supportive of people who are going through that. But somebody like Ben Shapiro, it kind of breaks his brain and he has not evolved to realize that trans people are deserving of respect and you don't need to antagonize them like he does sometimes on his, or has done historically. But how is somebody like that going to evolve their position if we cancel them? All that's yeah. going to do is make them go behind a Patreon wall or you know a subscription wall, and then you're never going to hear their opinion again. I would rather have Ben Shapiro's opinion out in public and somebody be able to say, hey, Ben, like I, if I was friends with Ben, I'd take him on the side and say, have you met a trans person? Do you understand what they're going through? You know, are you anti-gay as well? Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. have you learned to realize that gay people are deserving of respect? Okay, you have? Okay, now let's talk about this issue of trans. Like it's, this is not what you may think it is. And why don't you open your heart a little bit, open your mind a little bit and let's talk about it. But instead, if you cancel them, that's just gonna dig people into this position, right? Yeah, um, which is not 100%. helpful. Well, and, and I think that's the point is that, you know, people are, doing so much accusing. And so people are so defensive. And I think what you're saying is you get more flies with honey. And if I would like would to see more discourse that. about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah. when I was growing up, we were trained to think in the seventies or eighties, I'm sorry right. to tell people yeah, the yeah. truth, but yeah. you know, growing up in Brooklyn, that was like, if you were gay, that was like really weird and strange yeah. and horrible. Yeah. And you know, gay people yeah. were scared to walk down the street and be gay in a major city, New York City. Like if you were out in New York City in the 70s, 80s, you were taking a huge risk that you might get beaten up. Just like somebody who's trans today actually is taking a huge risk to live their truth and to live their lifestyle. And so I I just wish people would, when somebody is not thinking straight about an issue, you what the best way to address that is to take them on the side privately and say, hey, can we talk about that? Mm. How did you get to that belief? why do you believe that that person is an abomination or something like that? What, where did you get that from? Did your parents tell you that? Did your rabbi, your priest tell you that? Who told you that? Why do you believe that? Okay, great. Have you met that person? Have you met a gay person? Have you met a trans person? Okay, you know, let, yeah. let's start opening up your consciousness to some possibilities here, yeah. um, as opposed to you know, dunking on them and canceling them, which then serves only to reinforce Exacerbate the I mean, problem, right? The, the, the Confederate statues is a perfect example. You know, I, there's such an easy solution to this, which is we're not going to throw these things away and melt them. We're going to put them in a museum and mm-hmm. put them in context. Yes. We understand historical figures yes. lived at a different time where things were unacceptable, whether it was slavery, whether it was misogyny, et cetera. We're going to just put these things in context, which is exactly what happened with Nazi memorabilia in Germany and other places. They were like, listen, we're, we're not going to leave SWAT stickers up at the top of like yeah, coliseums, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to, I mean, in, in fact, we, they did destroy them uh, for good reason, but a lot of other things were preserved and put in museums so people could say, hey, let's remember what happened here and mm-hmm. let's put it in context. That seemed to me, when I talked to historians about that issue, or I read, I didn't actually talk to one, I read mm-hmm. historians' positions because when I heard that position about the Confederate statue, I was like, I wonder what historians think of this. And they're like, right. yeah, you, you don't need to destroy them. You need to put yes. them in context so that people yes. understand, hey, here's what that statue means. Here's why it's offensive to some people. And here's who that person was. Yes, this person had slaves and this fo- person fought in the Confederacy to maintain slavery. Not a great life choice, you know, evil. Uh, and we probably don't want people whose ancestors were enslaved having to walk by somebody who enslaved them and fought to keep them enslaved. Like that is the most insensitive thing. I mean, would you allow Jewish people to walk by a Hitler statue or a SWAT sticker statue on the way to work every day? Of course not. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with the Confederacy statues. You just have to pause for a second and have a reasonable discussion about it. And you could come to that conclusion very quickly, like very easily. It's, it's not a hard position to come to. So I, that's where like that issue with the media did such a terrible job of yeah. mitigating that where they, you know, MSNBC showing, showing these statues being thrown in rivers and people cheering, and then on the, which seems crazy to destroy artifacts, like that does trigger people thinking about destroying of artifacts is, 
not something we do. You would put them in a museum. And then on the other side, you know, like, wow, you, you're supporting leaving a Hitler statue or a SWAT sticker out. Like it's, it literally is the equivalency of that for some people yeah. uh, who were affected by it, obviously. Yeah. Anyway, this is a great discussion. Thank you for having uh, No, Jason. Who's having this discussion? I mean, this right, is exactly, like exactly. an incredible this is, discussion. This is the discussion, right? This is the discussion. But no, you, you've given us so much here. And I, I feel like, you know, you're at the center of everything. You've been behind companies that are that are changing society. But it's really comforting to know that there's a depth of consideration for people mm. with somebody who is uh, so important in the ecosystem and, and who has, who can think about the technological implications and see where things are going, but also have compassion in it and want to see us come together because yeah. this is really a problem. And I, and oh, I, I, I gotta go. <laughs> oh, you, you have to go. Do you have a plug to get in? Uh, no, you follow me on Twitter. I'm at Jason. Um, and my podcast is this week in startups. And then I have a second podcast called all in. Jason, thank you again for being here. Next week, we've got David Smick, who is the director of the film Stars and Strife, which, which is right in the bullseye of what we're talking about here. Please remember, this show is dedicated to the notion of e pluribus unum, out of the many, one. We believe that we can work through our differences without deepening divides, and we value perspectives that are different from our own. Thank you for joining us as we embark on the long road to national recovery and sustainable discourse. As always, if you like this show and found it helpful, please subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows and visit oxfordroad.com to subscribe to The Influencer, our weekly newsletter. Thank you to Bianca, Kyle, Jennifer, and the team at WIT for making this happen. We have a republic. Let's try to keep it. <laughs>